Good morning, Ni Hao. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here. And, and uh, really, uh, again, I think uh, 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 a uh, fair amount of uh, 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 accolade is due again to Doreen for the terrific work and having us here, really, very much so. Um, uh, what I'd like to do begin with is introduce uh, some of the folks who will be talking about some of the issues uh, in no particular order. We don't want to hurt any fe feelings, so it's quite random. Uh, Debendra Er is a director, uh, is the director of the Media Defense uh, Southeast Asia. This is a network uh, made of lawyers and media advocates dedicated to protecting uh, and promoting free speech and media freedom around Southeast Asia, and Deep is also uh, the chairman of the Kuala Lumpur State Bar Committee, uh, and is generally known as uh, the wise young man of, uh, of uh, Southeast Asia, and has his ear to the ground constantly on uh, 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 the development of, of these issues uh, throughout the region. Rob Balin, who has already been uh, pointed out, a, I would imagine, a badge of honor by uh, uh, my Lord Lester, was, uh, is a partner at uh, David Wright, uh, Davis Wright Tremaine rather, in New York. He uh, represents clients in many aspects of media law, but uh, like myself, has a particular uh, experience in the international aspect. Uh, and I, I'm honored to call Rob a friend and uh, known him for many years. Uh, Dennis Kwok is a legislative counselor uh, here in Hong Kong and a founding member of both the Civic Party and the Professional Commons. Uh, he is also a central member of the Citizens Commission on Constitutional Development. Uh, Peter Nordlander, another dear friend, is the chief executive officer of the Media Law Defense Initiative, uh, which is quickly becoming, are we on still? Uh, which is quickly becoming a, uh, one of uh, the EU's most notable and influential uh, uh, organizations uh, involving free speech and uh, media freedoms. Uh, Peter is individually uh, an attorney and has litigated in a number of uh, uh, very high level uh, international courts, including the European Court of Human Rights and uh, before the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Uh, Xu Shen is the executive director uh, uh, at the Center for Media Law at China University and is the former legal director of Chinese National Radio. Uh, do I have that correct? Yes? Yes, I'm happy to hear that. So, uh, we have some of the introductions out of the way, so let's get to some stuff. Um, the first thing that I, I wanted to note uh, by way of introduction was I thought that the title was brilliant. Five years ago, we would constantly, uh, at these sort of panels and at various and sundry, be it in the academic or in the legal context, we would talk about internet law. And uh, 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 I find that we have now evolved to a place where, I, I remember in 1996 writing an essay, I was a very early adopter of the internet, but before there was a World Wide Web, actually. And uh, I remember seeing this in, in writing that, you know, to a great extent, this is old wine in a new bottle. And I've come to realize that, in fact, while that is true to a great degree, that bottle is flying around the world at lightning speed and going crashingly sometimes through windows and front doors, if we can uh, analogize people's reputations to windows and front doors. Uh, so uh, I, I think that there is, there is a brilliance here and in, the, uh, in calling it media law in the internet age. Um, that does not denude uh, particularly unique issues uh, that arise uh, because of the medium itself, McLuhan not being wrong about the medium being the message. Okay, uh, let, let's, let's start off with uh, uh, a question for Dipendra. Um, looking at, and we're going to, by the way, uh, this session is going to raise a number of different issues that you are uh, going to discuss, one hopes, 
throughout the course of the next day and a half. Uh, certainly inside of 40 minutes or an hour, we cannot or would not attempt to exhaust anything. So think of this as a curtain raiser, think of it as a buffet of appetizers, as you would, for some very important issues that we're gonna hear. So deep, uh, looking in Southeast Asia, um, we've seen over the past year some remarkable uh, developments. Um, we have seen uh, the New York Times and Bloomberg uh, publish stories about the immortals, the uh, children of the very powerful and wealthy uh, uh, Chinese oligarchs, as it were, who have acc accrued uh, remarkable wealth. Uh, the Chinese government responded by blocking the, uh, those companies' websites. Uh, we've seen consistent, both uh, uh, online and in print, uh, 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 cases of les majeste in Thailand. Uh, and more recently, uh, some of the Malaysian courts have made uh, law that, uh, I, rather than uh, uh, steal the thunder, I thought I might uh, give you the opportunity to talk about some of the recent Malaysian cases and perhaps um, explain to folks what some of the general concerns in the region are for online publications. Deep? Yeah. Um, thanks, Charles. Um, the thing about Southeast Asia, uh, in an overview, is that it's an extremely diverse uh, region. You're looking at about over in excess of 600 million people. And, and one of the uh, earliest policies that formed Southeast Asia is that each country will not interfere with another. So that, that policy, uh, the non-interference policy, uh, permeated through every level of society, uh, downward <coughs> and uh, horizontally and vertically, which essentially meant that countries will not traditionally interfere with another country's uh, policy making, decision making, no matter how unjust and how ridiculous it is. And that thinking also went downwards and it, it uh, permeated, like I said, to you know, various branch of uh, the government, judiciary and, and, and even parliament and even, even the uh, legislature. Now, what I want to focus would be uh, two things essentially um, and, and in the background of this non-interference policy and what Lord Lester earlier said about Hong Kong having really independent judges uh, I don't really share the same optimism when one talks about S Southeast Asian countries. Ever so often, uh, judges in Southeast Asia, and the numerous cases would attest to it, judges get confused between judicial activism and judicial activity. Mm. A lot of them feel that judicial activity, getting up from their chambers, walking to the bench, sitting down there, and passing law to be judicial activism. And it is because of that confusion, um, judges have become extremely compliant, extremely pliant to what the state wants them to be. And this is where the uh, disconnect happens because you have, um, you have individuals, you have groups seeking to fight for their, for their rights. And, and very clearly some of these rights are enshrined in, in, in various countries' constitution, but judges don't see it. They see it as a means of, well, yeah, the right is there, but there are also other laws which prevent me from um, looking at it from a constitutional point of view. Uh, the state believes that this is, the, um, this is the way forward to protect order, to protect security, to protect uh, or to make sure that the feelings of one group is not offended. Deep, what's an, what's an example of a, of a case or a holding like that? Uh, there, there, there are plenty. I think uh, if you look at Thailand, the uh, less majestic cases would be would be one good example. Uh, in, in in my own country, in, in Malaysia, um, it's it's clear that if you touch on the three R's, as as I would call it, race, religion, and royalty, then you are asking for trouble. If you stay clear of these three things, then you're quite fine. Um, but the moment you talk about uh, issues relating to race or religion, not so much about the religion per se or the race per se, but for example, economic policies that benefit um, one particular race or one particular group of people, then it, it is not classified as an economic issue, but it's immediately classified as a religious issue, and therefore it's a no-no. So that, that is um, um, at least two examples that I can think of. 
Um, just, just to complete, uh, I think one challenge really, and, and since we're talking about the internet age, uh, in the last 10 years, the internet has become a great democratization tool, I, I <laughs> democratization <laughs> tool. Sorry, I, I, I have a slight lift, so sometimes it, you know, I get tongue tied and twisted. Um, so as a result of that, um, um, the internet becomes a bit of a problem for governments. States generally don't know how to deal with um, um, the free flow of information from the internet. You find that uh, traditional avenues like newspapers and television and radio having less and less of an impact compared to the internet. So states are forced to react and rather than embrace the internet, they find ways to clamp, close down, enact different laws. Uh, in Malaysia recently, we have come up with, the, uh, with an amendment to the Evidence Act, which essentially says that you are now guilty until proven innocent. What this means is that if material is posted from your account, you are automatically assumed to be the owner, and you have the burden of proving that it didn't come from you, or it's not defamatory, or it's not seditious, or, or anything to that, to, that, to, that, uh, to, uh, to that point. So in a nutshell, one challenge now is whether we look at media law and policy as a freedom of expression issue, or whether it's a democracy issue. I think we should look at it uh, um, um, from the point of democracy because the internet helps promote democracy. Freedom of expression will come and go. Uh, 10 years ago, it was the newspapers, television. Today, it's the internet. Tomorrow, it would be something else completely. So we have to look at it from a democracy issue and how we move from here. The opportunities and the challenges must stem from this, this very basic uh, understanding. Well, if we see this platform of speech, whether it was the Telegraph 150 years ago, Twitter today, and again, as you point out, who knows what tomorrow, if we see this as a element of democratization, see, that wasn't so hard. It wasn't so hard. And, uh, yes, my Americans. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, if, if we see that as an element uh, taking what uh, those in the states, the Justice Brennan approach, that uh, the, that a free press is part of the 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 foundation of a functioning democracy, um, taking all that into account, uh, one has to wonder uh, whether or not the imposition of liability. Uh, for internet postings, or, or uh, let me rephrase that, to what degree of scienter, to what degree of knowledge and involvement is required to impose liability seems to be the greatest reflective question we have across all of our different cultures. So with that being said, I want to move to Rob for a moment. Uh, with one caveat, and that is with the, the greatest respect, my Lord Lester, I think uh, we, uh, the, the, the Section 230 defense in the United States is, is not really absolute. It's pretty damn close, and we, we like it that way, of course, but it, it is not absolute, I, and, and we can chat about that some other time. But Rob, um, taking, taking what uh, Deep said, we know as a principle that, uh, that more speaker is better, uh, we know that we need more speakers to make democracy work. We know that speech is moving faster, farther, harder, wider than it ever did. Where does that, uh, where does that leave us with some of the different models of internet liability? Sure. Um, and and I, uh, I, I actually, I think Ying got the phrase right. When, it, when we talk about uh, internet or internet intermediary liability, we're really talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and uh, we have a system worldwide now where you see different regions, different countries pulling in different directions. Um, uh, one of the things that Heather didn't say about Lord Lester is not only does he have an incredible knowledge of his own country's laws, he also has an incredible knowledge of my country's laws. Uh, and uh, he mentioned New York Times v. Sullivan, and, and I actually want to talk about this, I guess now, 60-year-old case, because it's actually incredibly relevant, uh, I think, to this whole issue about not only what are the standards, but who are we going to hold liable. Uh, Lord Lester described a little bit of the case, but 
Uh, it is known, I think, it, to many law students in my country and to people around the world as a First Amendment case. It was also a civil rights case. Uh, and uh, if you put yourself in 1964, uh, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States is in full swing. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King has been jailed, uh, threatened, uh, and the center of activity is Alabama. And the reality is that for the civil rights movement to get its message out, it had to get into the newspaper, it had to get on TV. Uh, and the Times, which was reporting on activity down in Alabama, had now been sued uh, twice with uh, $500,000 awards against it. This is 1964. It couldn't really bear uh, much more of that. Um, the speech, uh, and Lord Lester has told you this is the case, of course, in which our Supreme Court recognized that there needs to be, in a democracy, the ability to discuss and criticize uh, our rulers, uh, uh, those who we elect, particularly in a participatory democracy. What is, I think, not known by most people is that New York Times v. Sullivan wasn't New York Times reporting. It was an advertisement. It was what we would call user-generated content. Uh, it was uh, a political ad fundraising for uh, the Legal Defense Committee for Martin Luther King, a rather bogus lawsuit in Alabama. Uh, but the lesson, at least I take away from this case, is it does matter, uh, and I think Justice Brennan saw that, uh, that in order to allow people to speak and to engage in a participatory democracy, you need to protect the method of communication. Uh, and that is really what's at issue, I think at least, uh, uh, with respect to internet liability. Lord Lester started to talk about, and there is, there is a sliding scale. There is w what exists in, in, in our country uh, which is close to uh, uh, absolute immunity uh, as long as a, 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 and by the way, internet uh, intermediaries, we are talking about a whole range of folks. We're talking about Baidu, we're talking about Google, we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about news websites. And the question is, when should they be held liable for what people say? Because the reality is it does affect the amount of speech there is. In the US, we surely have the most protective regime. Uh, and it is subject to some criticism, and I, and I think not unfairly, uh, that it is incredibly protective of expression. It is not necessarily as protective uh, of reputation, uh, particularly because this is one of the realities I think we all know of the internet. So much of posts and tweets and messages and comments is anonymous or pseudonymous. And if you can't, if your reputation has been injured and you can't find the person and you don't have a claim against the intermediary, it can lead to situations in which there is no real recovery for harm to reputation. That's uh, something that, at least in our system, we consider to be a price of, uh, of freedom. Um, I, I just wanted to the other end of the extreme because I, I, I think that's, that's, that's uh, the issue, I believe, in this part of the world, uh, which is holding internet intermediaries strictly liable, in essence, for what users post online. Uh, and uh, there has been uh, a real upsurge in laws around the world uh, in which this is happening. And there is an unfortunate, to my mind at least, case that just came out uh, from the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the Delphi case v. Estonia, uh, that I, I actually think it's an important case because it's so usual. The facts of this case is what happens every day. Uh, website in Estonia, uh, it's an article, it's like every website has articles, and then readers post comments. An article of all things about ice roads. Now, uh, that's probably not a big issue of interest to the public here in Hong Kong, uh, but in Estonia it is. Uh, apparently, uh, the Baltic freezes in the winter. People need to drive out to the islands and to come back. And they drive and it's cheap. 
Well, a new f a ferry service put a new ferry line in, broke up the ice, and now people couldn't drive back and forth and had to pay for the ferry. And hundreds of posts, hundreds of comments, because this matters to people, uh, including really juvenile, offensive, threatening, and some anti-Semitic comments as well. Uh, the kind of what we would call insults that at least in, I think, the English system and in our system would not be actionable, but they were actionable in Estonia. And the question was, and by the way, this, this internet intermediary did just about everything you would expect of a responsible website. They had a policy that said you can't defame or insult people uh, in your comments. They actually had a button you could push uh, if you thought something was defamatory, insulting, and they would take it down. Uh, they got uh, a complaint about 20 of these comments. Apparently, people were criticizing, no surprise, the ferry company and its uh, CEO. And the very day that they got this complaint, they took the post down. So what more were they supposed to do? It went, to the, went through the courts in Estonia, and they essentially said, you have an affirmative obligation to monitor what people are saying uh, on, on your site. Uh, and it is that very principle that I think uh, is an important topic uh, of conversation in this part of the world, in, in, in many other countries, uh, because it is, I think, the dividing line between uh, different notions of how much we should be protecting speech. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, by the way, uh, the Estonian newspaper, uh, challenged uh, the ruling of the Estonian courts as uh, a infringement of its free expression rights under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And in what I thought was rather remarkable um, uh, uh, reasoning, uh, the court found that precisely because this was a story of public interest, that the website should have known it would provoke discussion and debate and somehow taken extra precautions. One would have thought that that might be a reason to protect speech, uh, not to give it less protection. Uh, they also pointed out what I think are two realities uh, on the internet. One, that the, there was anonymous speech, these were anonymous posts, uh, and that in essence, uh, the, uh, uh, the website, the news website, had assumed the risk by allowing anonymous speakers on its website. The last thing it talked about was the commercial reality, and it, it's true, uh, that uh, there are uh, the advertising revenues that websites get is based on the number of eyeballs, uh, and including the number of people who, who, who post comments. Um, I am hoping that this particular uh, decision uh, is, I guess, appealed to the, to the Grand Chamber uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it really, I think, is in the wrong direction. I really have to put in a plug uh, for the Defamation Act uh, at the end of this because <laughs> that's the direction uh, that I, I do see most enlightened democracies going. Uh, they recognize that, particularly when people are identifiable, you can't be holding intermediaries liable for the speech of others, and that's the reality. More difficult when it's anonymous speech. I know the parliament pretty much, with respect to anonymous posts, kicked the can down the road to their secretary of state to uh, promulgate regulations. One last note. Uh, uh, this is coming to the attention, not just of uh, national legislatures, but to the UN Special Reporter on Human Rights and all the regional reporters who advocate uh, that passive intermediaries should not be held liable for user-generated speech. Um, well, uh, taking that on board, let's sort of shift it over a little bit. Peter, let's talk about uh, some of the European analogs to what Rob was talking about. It seems shocking that we have that liability, yet there's been some good movement in other directions for online speech. Can you t talk sure, about that? Sure, sure. I mean, Strasbourg is a court that has ups and downs. It's made up of you know a number of sections. Some of the sections really get free speech, and some of them get it less. <laughs> right. Um, and here we had a section that, that just didn't get it. And moreover, it was made up of a number of judges who did also uh, were unfamiliar with European Union law. Um, um, the judgment that they came up with 
arguably flies in the face of EU standards and for that reason alone needs to be you know, referred to the Grand Chamber, as well as for the various other reasons that you mentioned. It also reflects very badly and sets a bad precedent globally. I mean, I think we've got people from Thailand here. There's a case, you know, there's various, well, there's one case in particular in Thailand that's still on appeal of the editor of Prachatai, who was in prison. Well, who received a suspended prison sentence in exactly these circumstances. But Strasbourg does come out with a couple of good things from time to time, and they've got a few very hard and fast rules. And one of the extremely hard rules that they have, in fact, this is a, this is a bottom line that they said, is that no journalist should be imprisoned for writing nasty things about other people. Um, if I libel you, I can be fined. I can be, you know, a, a, a damage um, award can be made against me, which has to be within certain reason. I cannot go to prison. It's as simple as that. And, and, and why is that? Well, because it's bad for journalism, but also because it's bad for society, right? If you send a journalist to prison, society as a whole suffers. And the Strasbourg Court values both those aspects of the right to freedom of expression. It's the right of the journalist to publish on issues of public interest and the right of the public um, to receive that. I should add, by the way, that this is a standard that's not just been recognized for Strasbourg, but also under the main UN United Nations Convention on uh, Civil and Political Rights, um, and which in a recent case from the Philippines, the UN Human Rights Committee, which is like the UN Court for Human Rights, um, upheld in, in no uncertain terms, in fact. And it's Harry Roque, who's sitting over there, took that case. It concerned um, a Philippine senator who was imprisoned. No, sorry, the Philippine senator was caught running around naked in a hotel. Is that right, Harry? Yeah, it's something As, like as that. one does. Yeah, yeah, as one, you know, when you're in politics, yeah. right? I wouldn't know. Um, a radio a broadcaster, um, you know, did the story on that and um, ended up in prison for allegedly having libeled this person. The UN Human Rights Committee came out very strong and said imprisonment for libel is impermissible. It, it, it violates the right to freedom of expression. And Harry is now working with his team to get that standard to the Philippine Supreme Court, you know, accepted at the Philippines level, and from there hopefully to spread it through the rest of the region. But so, you know, if you're looking for hard and fast rules, that's one. Nobody gets imprisoned. Um, one might hope that that is... Uh Infectious, and with, but we don't know. And in that light, uh, I'm going to put uh, Xu Shen on the spot and ask about the the Chinese other side of the bookend. That is to say, we've seen now a characterization of speech online in the United States as being virtually immune in absolute terms. We've seen now uh, that in Europe the notion of uh, arresting a journalist is somehow offensive to human rights, yet we've seen recently, um, with great publicity, the cases about internet rumors and uh, uh, the liability that uh, 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 people uh, uh, with it can attach, rather, uh, to those uh, accused of, of publishing rumors. And uh, perhaps you can tell us what drives that, and what's the and what's the future of that? Uh, uh, very happy to be here to say a few words. I'm from China. Um, China's online media. Uh, for Chinese internet development is going through a rapid process. With the advancement, with the advancement of technology, netizens in China have become the largest group in China. But I thought, in my personal opinion, China as a whole was not prepared. Uh, uh, However. The traditional Chinese media, the legal order is being established. It is not perfect yet. 
and it is still going through a transformation. And Chinese internet development is very rapid, so we are facing a very complicated situation. And it is something that's very difficult for you to imagine. And Professor Chen has asked me to talk about what we are thinking about in mainland China as researchers for media law. Well, of course, for me to personally to summarize what everyone is thinking is difficult, but I can tell you about what I myself personally is focusing on. If I could summarize, uh, in recently, I have been focusing on the fate of uh, two teenagers. They are both below 18. Uh, one is a netizen from uh, Gansu. His name is Yang Hui. He's 17 years old this year. And online, he has issued uh, a comment. And he has raised doubt about the police. Um, and the local police bureau has arrested him. Uh, for causing trouble and for raising doubt about the local police bureau. And this event has caused great attention among the netizens. And the netizens have been following the case closely. In the end, the teenager, due to the local police bureau's um, unruling behavior, uh, this boy was released, um, and the uh, local policemen involved, they were sacked as a result. Of course, this 17-year-old teenager being arrested, the policemen are saying that they have done this according to the new interpretation of the Chinese High, Ho High Court. And this interpretation online, this legal interpretation online, uh, recently has attracted great attention um, on the internet and the media coverage. And I believe uh, scholars from mainland China uh, will be talking about this more extensively in tomorrow's um, panel discussion. And another teenager that I will refer to uh, is um, Li Mo Mo. And um, because he is not an adult yet, um, so I cannot name him. And I believe all the Chinese people know who I'm talking about because his parents are very famous singers in China. And so the story related to teenager Li has been widespread in China. Uh, he's been involved in a uh, gang rape case for a legal proceeding for rape, rape cases. Um, normally, the, such cases will not be, uh, you know, will not be uh, dealt with in public. However, this case was widespread online. And information related to his case um, was all over the papers and uh, all over the internet. Not only that, his personal information was released to the public, also the victim's information was revealed. Even the um, report from the hospital of the victim was published. Pu published. Actually, if you were to deal with this case in private, a lot of the information should be should have been kept um, secret. So whether this case is, um, there are many confusing points uh, with this case. And uh, in the first um, 
dealing of the court case, he has been sentenced for 10 years, and right now the case is going uh, through the court of appeal. Um, for those two teenagers, they are involved in different cases, uh, but I believe they merits great value in the development of media law in China, and we will continue to uh, pay attention to those two cases. Thank you very much, Xie uh, Very, very important, and I look forward to that. Um, we could not have a discussion about uh, uh, media law policy on in the internet age without touching upon any aspect, at least initially, of intellectual property, and we're very lucky that uh, Dennis Kwok is going to talk to us uh, for a few minutes about uh, some development in copyright law. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, that's right. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, as Lord Lester pointed out, um, politicians in Hong Kong, they, we, we, of course, there are a lot of party games in Leshko and squabbling and filibustering, but running around naked in a, in a hotel room or, or in Leshko is something we haven't got around to, but I, I'll, thanks, <laughs> thanks for the suggestion. I'll pass it on to Long Hair when I see him this afternoon. <laughs> Good. Um, but, but apart from all that, we, we do try very seriously to look at law reform issues uh, in Hong Kong. And a recent uh, issue, a uh, recent controversy is the Copyright uh, Amendment Bill in Hong Kong. A uh, little bit of background, the Copyright Ordinance in Hong Kong is based very much on the uh, UK uh, Copyrights Act <coughs> 1988. Uh, apart from a, little, uh, a few minor uh, amendments since, uh, the copyright ordinance in Hong Kong remains pretty much pre-internet. Uh, I see gladly the, the chairperson of the Copyrights Tribunal is is is, is the <laughs> ex uh, uh, chairperson. So any any specific questions you could you could ask Gladys. But what we're, what we're facing here in the Legislative Council is to deal with how to update the uh, copyrights ordinance so that it um, accords with the internet age and the internet requirements. Um, the government tried to do that in 2011 by putting through a copyrights amendment bill by building in concepts such as uh, communication rights so as to update uh, what you do on the internet, sort of activities you do on the net, internet in sharing files, in up uploading links, uh, etc. to sort of trying to update the co copyright ordinance to cater for those situations. Now, in Hong Kong as in anywhere else, uh, the internet uh, 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 social websites or the news website is actually more powerful in many ways than uh, traditional news media. Uh, so in Hong Kong, there's no exception. And the netizens in Hong Kong, those uh, citizens critics who uh, frequently use the internet to criticize government policy, to satire uh, uh, politicians, etc., are <laughs> extremely sensitive to any attempt or any perceived attempt on the part of the government to, uh, in trying to sen censure what they do on the internet. And they see that as a threat to, to their right of uh, freedom of expression. And in Hong Kong, what they do uh, uh, is to, to use, a lot of times to use uh, famous movie posters or famous songs, uh, writing in their own lyrics uh, or to make fun of certain politicians by putting their face on on uh, on movie posters a privilege which I, I haven't had the, 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 the chance of, of having but uh, a lot of politicians and, and chief executive etc including uh, the chief executive uh, are, are satirized in, in that way so they fear that this new law or the, this new copyrights amendment ordinance would, would um, affect their, their right so that, after a lot of controversy, the, the government finally backed down. And recently, they put out a new consultation paper uh, addressing this issue. And following the trend in Australia, in Canada, and in the UK, uh, they are proposing uh, several options, one of which is to include an exception uh, for parody and satire, uh, at, and asking the netizens, principally, whether this is acceptable to them. But netizens uh, always want something better. And uh, now they are proposing a fourth option, which is something Rob touched on briefly, uh, which is called the user's uh, generated content exception, which I think is uh, being used in the Canadian legislation. Uh, but again, I think this step will be seen by the government and especially the copyright, uh, the IP lobby, as a step too far uh, infringing on their, their rights. But this controversy is very much going on. And in Let's Go, what we're hearing are both, we're trying to balance both sides of the story and we're trying to address their concerns. But um, 
uh, I would like to very much to, to hear from the international experience as to how parody and satire works and it's very much an, an important part of uh, the citizen's critic's uh, job in, in using these, these parodies and satire to, to, to criticize uh, uh, government policy. So it is important that we keep that in Hong Kong with the view that, uh, that the law would also respect uh, copyright owners. But on that, um, um, I think... Well, thank you very much. I think we have a good sense of the wide range of topics that we've talked, uh, touched on lightly here, but we'll uh, hear about more in the next two days. Uh, I think uh, our time is pretty much at an end. Uh, we were behind, so uh, I'd like to thank our, our wonderful panelists, and again, Doreen, for the opportunity to uh, uh, flesh out some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you.